واحد شكرا friends once again from Aswan and this time let's do a little bit of tourism and then uh, I will share some thoughts about my journey in Egypt because this is gonna be the last video in Egypt Amazon, yeah. Hello. Hello. so first let's go to see some uh, some noble tombs here in Aswan as you probably know, the ancient Egyptians were very concerned about uh, what's going to happen after, they, after the, their death. So they were doing beautiful tombs. So I'm just going to show you a few tombs from like a high hierarchy people from thousands, thousands of years ago. La vista es increíble aquí. All these are bones, all there, yeah. Wow. Huh? Oh, Serambut. Oh, this is Serambut. This is Serambut. This is my wife. Four. Oh, wife? Wife? Oh, you wife. Oh, this is wife. Okay, only one wife. Baby. Four baby. Four. Oh, four baby. Ah, okay. That's the babies. Ah. That's the babies, okay. Equatorial Africa 4,300 years ago for his father, for the, the, the guy and his son. This is absolutely insane. So he was not, a, not even a pharaoh, he was a noble, quite a high hierarchy, but not a pharaoh. Look at the magnificent tomb. So let's talk about Egypt a little bit. It's very interesting when you, you know what, every tourist comes to visit here in Egypt, it's mostly tombs. The pyramids are tombs, then they have these tombs in the caves, uh, man-made caves. So it made me come to conclusion to find something specific for Egyptian people. And I would say that it's very funny if you link, if you want to find a link between ancient Egypt and modern Egypt because of course with the arrival of Islam Egyptians kind of lost uh, the people lost the memory of the history of ancient Egypt inside inside themselves as because uh, the history was kind of wiped out to make place for a new new religion the common point between ancient Egypt and modern Egypt would be like a, an obsession for death for me like ancient Egyptians were, well it seems that they were living, they were thinking about their, their, their death and how to reach the afterlife uh, during all their life. 
that was the main, probably their main uh, concern. And still now, through, through religion, it's probably something very similar. I mean, the afterlife is called heaven now, but it's, it's, it's basically the same. They don't really care about, uh, about uh, what happens to them when they're alive. They seem to care a lot about what happened to them after they die. So it's very interesting to see that it seems that the Egyptian people have this mentality, this obsession for the afterlife since more than 5,000 years. And it actually, despite uh, the changes in religion, it actually never changed. Look at that! Wow! What the hell? Oh, this viewpoint is awesome! So you see all these ways, Komombo, Edfu, Luxor. And this way is where I'm gonna head in a few days. This way is Sudan. Uh, Swan is really cool, really, really cool. Such an awesome place to come here. There's a bit of hassle, but nothing compared to, to Luxor or to the pyramids. Look at that, guys. That's Elephantine, Elephantine Island. That's the bot botanical garden of Aswan. And that's Aswan. And the dunes. And the Sahara Desert starting just here. He is here in Aswan in search of the creation of monotheism. Because apparently, part of the, of the start of monotheism comes from here, from Elephantine Island. The first god, the first monotheist god was, of course, the Jewish god, Yahweh. Yahweh. And so the story says, the story is in two parts. The story, I don't know if it's, if it's true or not, it's what I heard from this uh, teacher of philosophy in the hostel. I don't know if it's reliable or not, but I love the story. So the story says that uh, first it was some people who were enslaved by the Egyptians, some people called the Shasu. And this Shasu, they started to, they had a, well, everyone was a polytheist around here, so they had a pantheon of gods, and they chose one god in their pantheon. Uh, apparently it was probably the god of war, and the god of war was called uh, Yaho or Yahu or Yahweh. And they decided to only pray for him. So they had only one god. And thanks to this god, they freed themselves from the Egyptians and managed to escape to the Sinai. And some time later, Moses arrived in the Sinai after also escaping with his tribe from the Egyptians, so from Egypt. And there he met a woman called Sephora, and he married Sephora. But Sephora was the daughter of the king of the Shasu. And then, so he met the father, and they talked about the god. And he discovered that, oh, the Shasu had a god called Yahweh, and the Shasu managed to defeat the Egyptians thanks to this god. So Moses thinks, thought, well, that sounds like a nice god if he can defeat the Egyptians. So, he decided to start believing in this god called Yahu or Yaho or Yahweh. And that's how probably, maybe, Jewish people starting, started praying only one god called Yahweh. So that's 3,200 years ago. But the thing is, at that time, monotheism was not stable yet. They were sometimes praying only Yahweh, but sometimes also they were praying Yahweh and his wife. And that's where Elephantine Island comes into play, because in the island just there, it was found apparently from some remains of a synagogue, and uh, from like 2,500 to 2,600 years ago. And what makes it special is that this synagogue was apparently dedicated to Yahweh, but also to, I don't remember her, her name, but also to, to the wife of Yahweh, I think maybe Anchar or Ashar or something like that. So at that time, they were not completely monotheist yet. And uh, even apparently, even in the temple in Jerusalem, they also had uh, the st a statue, they, they were praying for Yahweh and also for his wife. It's only after 
uh, probably 2,500 years ago, that uh, really they completely decided to remove. It's when they wrote the Talmud, basically, I think, that they decided to just remove the wife and have only one God and pray only to Yahweh. The wife was removed from the religion and the religion became completely patriarchal and monotheistic. And the first monotheistic religion was born. Oh, man, it looks like I'm stuck. Oh, maybe I could go down. Yeah, I can go down there, I think. How do you go down here? Ah, what the hell? How do I go down? Look at that. Is that a tomb? What the hell? No, it doesn't look like a tomb. So let's switch to the third, oh my God, to the third thought that came to my mind after this uh, three month, this, uh, three months in Egypt. Cultural contrast. Yeah, the, the very strong contrast, cultural contrast. Before I traveled, before I, I traveled, yeah, I used to believe, I think I have probably, I think, I, I think, I don't know, you will tell me, I think I have a good heart. So I wanted to be a good person. So I used to believe what people tell you in Europe. That's, in the end, we are all almost the same. And if you want to be a good person, that's what you have to think when you are in Europe. And then I traveled. And then I quickly understood. Not quickly, actually. It took me a long time. But uh, not quickly at all. It took me years to understand that. But I, I ended up understanding that, well, no, we are not all the same. What a beauty. Yeah, we are not all the same. And actually, the cultures are so different. I mean, how can you consider the same? Like, for example, if I just compare Egypt to the country where I come from. So Egypt is a very religious country. You can see when you walk around. It's been three months I'm here and I'm, I am here. And honestly, for example, the religious pressure on society is absolutely huge. I mean, you can, you can see religion is part of, of life here when you are in Egypt. You, you, you cannot forget religion. As soon as you step in the street, you have religion jumping at you everywhere. So, a very religious society. And if you compare to the country where I come from, the modern version of this country, of course, France used to be uh, a very Catholic country during 1,300 years, but since uh, a bit more than 200 years, it's the opposite. It completely flipped and it became probably the most anti-religious country in the world. So in the end, it's really hard to... I, I don't understand how you can say that we are all the same when like people from, from France, it's just all the... All, I mean, everything you expect from life is completely different. If in a country like uh, where most people are atheists, people look for a good life on earth, which is completely different from religious people who look for a good life after death. So it's, it's I mean, Basically, it's completely the opposite. And it's, I mean, it's, everyone has his own culture, has its own beliefs, I have no, pro no problem with that. But, but we are not all the same. The world is very diverse, we are all very different from each other, but actually that's the richness of the world, and that's what's act what actually makes the traveling fascinating, because, because of all these differences that are absolutely fascinating. Okay, fourth thought. I will talk about the fact that when you are away, when you are in a foreign culture, somehow you are not really, well it depends how long, but when you're just passing, traveling through a foreign culture without settling in the country, you are not completely subject to the rules, to the local rules somehow, which is something somehow I like. And I will start this story with a small anecdote, a very silly anecdote, maybe it's just stupid, but a very silly anecdote about uh, here and Jordan, actually. You see, I'm wearing shorts. And wearing shorts is not, it's probably not a great idea when you are in the Middle East, when you are in countries, in very, in, uh, in countries that are very strictly Muslims. 
men should not wear shorts. And what's funny then, so, is because when you wear shorts, actually, you can be, it's a very easy way to be subversive. You know, in the West now, it's very, you can't really be subversive anymore. There is no counterculture anymore because the counterculture has become the culture. So, like, everyone is subversive now. But uh, anyway, here, you can wear shorts and be subversive. And you can see it also because, for example, like when I was in Cairo, I would, uh, uh, the last time I went to Cairo, I was staying in a big building, and then when I would go down, the guys of the reception, if I would wear long pants, the guys of the reception always like, yeah, hey, hello, hello, they always give you a, make you a, soul, a small sign to, to show their sympathy. But when you wear short, suddenly, nothing. No hello, no goodbye, no nothing, not even a look. It's just a small thing, but it kind of make you, make you feel that you're not following the rules. And it was similar in Jordan as well. Not in, some, not in Amman or in Aqaba, but in, a, in, more, in smaller towns where there are, there are tourists, but there are, there are less tourists. If you would wear shorts, I would get like a very, very, sometimes some very aggressive, uh, aggressive looks. Like, what the hell are you, are you wearing? This is uh, absolutely not appropriate. But also you have other reactions. You have the people looking at you in the streets looking at you with like kind of admiration, I don't know, because some locals also uh, wear shorts, but still, and they look at you like with some kind of admiration, maybe thinking, maybe it's just me inventing, but, but that's the way I was, I was seeing it, thinking, kind of admiring you just for like, look at this guy, look at the freedom he conquered, it's a small step towards more freedom, just basic freedom of, of wearing short pants. But it's funny to see this uh, admiration in the eyes of, uh, of some people. And also you have some other people who look like very religious, but still they look at you with a smile, thinking, look at this tourist who doesn't know anything. <laughs> He's wearing shorts and he has no idea what, uh, what it means here to wear shorts. But still they, part, they forgive you because they think, okay, he just doesn't know, he's just stupid. He doesn't know the culture. So let him go and they'd give you a welcome because they know you're a foreigner. And that last behavior, which is probably the most common towards tourists who are just passing by in the country. I mean, I guess if you settle in the country, then you have to follow the rules, of course. But when you're passing by, somehow you can be outside of the rules. Look at this beauty, guys. A monastery, I think that's a 1,500 years old monastery and the sunset and the beauty of the Sahara Desert. So yeah, somehow you are outside of the rules because many people will tolerate you because you're just passing by. And that's actually one of the reasons why I love traveling. Because anywhere, I mean any culture has, every culture has its own tyranny, its own rules. and and. When you know the culture, if you, wanna, if you don't want to play the subversive person, you, you have to follow those rules. But when you go away from your culture, when you exile yourself, well, you lose, of course, friends, family, home. You lose all those, wor all those words somehow. But you also gain freedom by the fact that you're away from your culture, so you don't have to follow the rules, the cultural rules, the rules of your culture. You don't have to, you're not subject anymore to the tyranny of your culture. And you're also not subject or not completely subject to the tyranny of other cultures. So somehow traveling is this, it's a way to free yourself. For me, to free myself and to be able to live away from, from the rules. Okay, fifth thought. Of course, it's a bit hard to talk about Egypt without talking about harassment. It's sad, but it's the way it is. It's uh, probably one of the worst countries in the world for harassment. So when I was alone, I did not uh, experience that much harassment. A lot in Luxor, but except Luxor, not that much. Because, uh, well, I'm used to, uh, now that I've traveled so much, I'm used to, uh, I know how to avoid it somehow. It's a lot about uh, how you walk, you have to walk 
not too slow, quite fast. Pretend to look as if you were, as if you knew where you're going. Very, you have to look in a very determined way, very confident. Never look around, just look straight ahead. Yeah, it's just a game. You have to pretend to be overly confident, like oh, I'm a smart ass, I'm a strong man. But then when my sister came, it was uh, quite different actually. It was completely different. Then when you're two, you look much more like tourists. So it was like uh, harassment tripled. Even here in Aswan, it was there was harassment. But the bad, the very very bad thing about harassment here in Egypt is, of course. Regarding uh, sexual harassment, it's one of the worst countries in the world for women. I mean, for women, for foreign women, it's... Well, I don't know how they do, honestly. It's really, it's really hard. Because for me, without, when I was alone, the touristic areas were not so nice. And then the, the non-touristic areas were like really nice, because uh, if you are a man, people are super friendly. And so it's very pleasant. But then, when you are with a woman, Suddenly, everything changes. The harassment triples in the touristic areas. And if you go away from the touristic areas, suddenly it just becomes dangerous. Because some guys, because the thing is like in the touristic areas, tourists are untouchable. Uh, the police is watching everywhere. There is a lot of uh, police and civilian. So Egyptians will never dare to touch a foreign woman or to to harass her. But once you are away from the tourism, then there is no more police. And then the sexual harassment comes and it's it's honestly really really bad and it's it's very scary. I mean in the end, just to give you a, an idea, in the end, probably I don't know the last the last days she was uh, my sister was here, we had to make her walk in front of me so that I can monitor all the surroundings to make sure nobody bothers her. It's really a shame, like really, really, really. So it was like really like any time you would go out in the streets, basically, you know, it's gonna be bad. So yeah, <laughs> not uh, it's not the most pleasant experience, let's say, to have to monitor and feel that actually you really, you truly feel that uh, there is a real danger when you are out there and uh, when you're a woman, basically. So, yeah, I guess, you know, all the experience, I just remind you then all the experience I show you. Of course, I'm a man, so I can only show you the point of view of a man. So, if you're a woman watching, don't consider that my experience, you would have a similar experience to mine. It could be very different. It really depends. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, in some countries, it's not... Uh, People don't uh, treat the men and women in the same way, so uh, the experience can be very, very different for a woman, especially in Egypt here. It's scary, honestly. <laughs>